Clay Jackson. and welcome to this edition of the Airport News Show, a half-hour informational program about the Jacksonville Aviation Authority. I'm Debbie Jones, Community Relations Administrator. On today's program, we're talking about Cecil Field. And since there's so much to cover, I want to dive right in and introduce my very special guest, Mr. Bob Simpson, who is the Senior Director of Cecil Field. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Debbie. It's good to be here with you uh, this afternoon. Well, I appreciate so much you coming because there's a lot going on at Cecil Field and I thought it was very timely to sort of not only talk about what's going on now, but sort of get everybody, give everybody a perspective of Cecil Field. So can we start off by talking about Cecil Field, which is one of the four airports in our airport system. So take it from there about Cecil Field and airport systems role and that kind of thing. Thanks Debbie, I'll do that. As you know Cecil Field was transferred to the Jacksonville Aviation Authority back in 1999 mm -hmm. and it is one of the four airports within our airport system. Of course we have Jacksonville International Airport to the north of, of town up here. We have Craig Airport and Herlong Airport which are general aviation airports that primarily deal with flight training and some corporate activity. And when Cecil Field came into our system, it really took on the role as a maintenance, repair, and overhaul, corporate, military, and governmental right. type of an airport. Of course, we have, you know, Department of Homeland Security has two squadrons out there, Florida Army National Guard, mm -hmm. Flight Star, Boeing, Naval Aviation Depot. We have many, many tenants at Cecil Field on the airport today, and we're actually looking to expand the operation out there over the next few years. So it's become a real jewel from the west side. It really has and we are very encouraged by what has happened already at Cecil and one of the things we're doing right now is we're going into some planning effort to see mm -hmm. what we can do with the property out at Cecil that is not currently developed. How we can do highest and best use of that land to bring jobs to the west side of Jacksonville and to the whole northeast Florida region. Well before we move to that, you mentioned that Cecil Field became a part of the Jacksonville Aviation Authority in 1999. Have you got a little bit more history about when was it built and, and those types of things? I, I think you have some pictures. I do, and to if we can us. go to that next picture. Uh, Cecil Field was built actually during World War II. Uh, this is a photograph of the original airfield at Cecil Field, a circular landing pad here with four basically asphalt runways. Two of the older hangars, this one and this one, are currently still at Cecil Field. In fact, we have U.S. Coast Guard occupies this hangar and Homeland Security occupies this hangar. This picture is probably about 1942. I have another photograph that shows Cecil Field when it was under construction when it became designated as a master jet base. They added three 8,000 foot runways and a 12,500 foot runway. And you can see some of the development as Cecil Field was being built. This picture was probably taken in the early 1950s. And then when the Navy departed Cecil Field in 1999, this is what it looked like. Again, second longest commercial runway in the state of Florida, 12,500 feet, three 8,000 foot runways, about 440,000 square yards of concrete reinforced apron. So it's a great opportunity for us to really uh, look at highest and best use of Cecil as we move forward with this planning effort. Okay, so that's a good perspective as far as the past and how we brought Cecil Field on and, and the role, the very important role it plays in our airport system, which really plays into what you were talking about, the master planning. Can you talk to us about what is that and why do we want to have a master plan out at Cecil Field? That's a very good question, Debbie, and, and what we're really doing now is we're looking to the future. Mm -hmm. We talked about the past, what Cecil Field was when we took it from the Navy. Right now, we are in the process of, of really rehabilitating existing mm -hmm. facilities. We've spent about $50 million between the Department of Transportation, the Federal, Federal Aviation Administration, and the JA on just getting Cecil Field up to the point where we can look to the future. We've basically renovated all the hangars out there. We've put new roofs on all the buildings. We've done new instrument landing systems. We've put in all new runway lights, taxiway lights. 
So we have spent the last few years getting Cecil Field to the point where we can now begin to move outside of existing facilities and develop some more areas that are out there. Just to give you an idea of how big Cecil Field is, this next slide, if you can go to that now, really superimposes the area that is Cecil Field over downtown Jacksonville, just to give a perspective. And as you can see, if you put Cecil Field over downtown, it would go all the way from Martin Luther King Drive to the north, down to Naval Air Station Jacksonville to the south, cover just about all of San Marco, all the way over to Riverside and Avondale. That's 17,225 acres of property. So what I think people really need to understand and what we are doing right now is sort of trying to figure out highest and best use of basically 17,225 acres. The city of Jacksonville is going to be doing some master planning on the area north of Normandy Boulevard, which is this area, and the Jacksonville Aviation Authority. We're involved in the planning process now to look at the south part. I do have kind of a, a rough sketch in just a second, but this outlines the property that's currently owned by the Jacksonville Aviation Authority. Of course, this is Normandy Boulevard. This is 103rd Street. What we have done so far is we have looked at all that area south of Normandy Boulevard. This again is Normandy, this is 103rd Street. We have a mixture of various types of uses because the outer beltway or Brandonfield Chafee Road will come through this area. We think highest and best use out in that particular part of Cecil is commercial retail types of activities because of the visibility on this road and because of the ease of access to the general public off 103rd Street and Brandonfield Road. Up a little bit further to the west, we have warehousing and distribution, some more aviation uses here, more aviation uses here, more aviation uses in this area, down here, and also another area that we may develop down in this area for general aviation purposes. Between Normandy Boulevard and 103rd, we have more warehouse and distribution, and another retail node over here at the intersection of Normandy New World Avenue, which connects up to Interstate 10 and Aviation Avenue. So we're looking at various types of uses for Cecil Field, and we think we have a pretty good plan here. It's still a work in progress. Right. We're working with the various entities and agencies around uh, Jacksonville, Jacksonville Economic Development Commission, the JEA, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and the Jacksonville Port Authority as far as what their role may be as they expand mm -hmm. will they need warehousing and distribution to handle all the activity that's going to be happening there so again we're very encouraged by what's happened at Cecil Field in the past and this gives us a vision a footprint a road map for how we're going to uh, develop Cecil as we move forward and I guess having an integrated approach as you were mentioning because you're not really planning a strip mall or a small scale project. This encompasses miles of property. So back to your thing of highest and best use, having a comprehensive idea of what works best for having access to, of course, the airport and the seaport and the highway system and the railroad system. It's important to have a good idea of what makes sense in that area. Exactly, and Debbie, as you know, uh, Cecil is well positioned from a transportation mm -hmm. perspective. Not only do we have a great airport, but just north of Cecil Field is Interstate 10, mm -hmm. Interstate 295 is just a few miles to the east, Interstate 75 about an hour drive uh, to the west of us. So what we're looking at is, is the intermodal aspects of that. There's a CSX rail line that borders Cecil Field to the north. So in our planning effort, we're really looking at how all that fits together, highest and best use, not only for the people who drive past Cecil Field right. every day, but also from a logistical standpoint, mm -hmm. how we can take advantage of, of the tremendous location and the assets that we have out at Cecil Field today. Well, you mentioned that you're working with a variety of entities because we're not the only ones who own property out there. You mentioned the city of Jacksonville is one of them. So I imagine it must be, at least in my thinking, a pretty significant task to try to bring everybody to the table to come up with a plan or several options that is agreeable to everybody and will move this project forward. Have you found that to be one of, if not the biggest challenge in the planning process? Definitely one of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. We have held two public meetings out at Cecil. We've had uh, 
several hundred people from the surrounding neighborhoods, communities, and residents and tenants out at Cecil Field mm -hmm. come out and we have rolled out this plan. The first meeting we had, we asked for their input. What would you like to see? What are your goals? What's your vision for Cecil Field? We took that, our planning team went back, they assembled and assimilated all that information, came back, we had another planning meeting just before Christmas, and uh, good feedback from the public. Right. So yes, we not only are we looking at the various governmental agencies, the private sector, but we're also making sure that we are we are sensitive to the needs of the surrounding communities and the neighborhoods at Cecil Field. I might also mention one of the components that I didn't mention that we're, we're planning out here at Cecil Field is to make sure there's plenty of recreation and open space. Oh, okay. As you know, uh, Cecil Field was 17,000 acres as I mentioned before. There's plenty of room for recreation and open space. In fact, we have set aside within just the Aviation Authority's property about 1,400 acres wow. designated solely for recreation and open space use. So we're trying to be sensitive to that, make sure we're good neighbors to the surrounding communities. Absolutely. That, that's really exciting. Now, I don't imagine that any of this is going to, we're not going to see any groundbreaking next year or maybe the year after. So do you have kind of a timeline as far as, is this a phased project or what can we expect to see going forward in 2008 and beyond? Very good question. The real purpose of our master planning effort is really to attract developers. Mm -hmm. While individual businesses may be interested in locating at Cecil Field, our goal in this, one of the primary goals in this, is to have a plan that we can take to the marketplace. There are many, many developers out there around the United States and around the world, quite frankly, that are looking for various options and opportunities in Northeast Florida. I've been very surprised over the last few months and, and actually the last year how many people have expressed an interest in the Northeast Florida region. Right. And when I say the Northeast Florida region, Cecil is just a small part of the whole Jacksonville area and the metropolitan area that we're talking about. Having said that, what we want to do is we want to get this plan out to that marketplace, to the development community, so that we can attract third-party investment in Cecil, create the jobs, create the opportunities, so that all of Jacksonville will benefit from it. Well, it sounds like Cecil Field is going to put a turbo jet on the engine of economic development out on the west side. Well, that's our hope, and, and <laughs> again, we're very optimistic that this is going to be a great, great project for us and for the whole community. Uh, Cecil is a tremendous asset, and uh, we look forward to the future. Well, Bob, what a, I know it's a very fast overview, but very, very interesting as we look forward and how exciting to know that this is on the table and that all these entities are working together to bring these jobs and businesses and industries and manufacturers to Jacksonville. So appreciate the overview and um, we're going to come back in just a moment and see how Cecil's going to get a little spacey in the future too. So don't go away. We'll be right back. While progress should never come to a halt, there are many places it should never come to at all. So we work locally with communities, businesses, and people like you to save precious places around the world forever. I'm Paul Newman. Help the Nature Conservancy save the last great places. Hello and welcome back to the Airport News Show. On today's program, we're talking about Cecil Field. In our first segment, Bob Simpson was giving us some details about a major planning project going on in the property around Cecil Field. And I sort of hinted that we were going to get a little spacey this segment, and I want to introduce you to the person that's going to tell us how that's going to work. I want to welcome Mr. Todd Lindner, who is the Administrator of Planning and Development, and also the Spaceport Program Manager. 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 Thank you. I got Spaceport Program and forgot to write the rest of it. But So, Todd, we talked a little bit about the purpose of Cecil Field and the future in the development around Cecil Field, this program really 
projects us into the future. So can you tell us a little bit about what a spaceport is, first off? Yeah, Cecil Field, I mean, Jacksonville Aviation Authority is in the process of obtaining a spaceport license for mm -hmm. Cecil Field. Uh, a spaceport, uh, in today's terms, unlike uh, what you're familiar with at Kennedy Space Center, uh, all the launches will be horizontal, no vertical launches. Uh, all rocket um, flight will be taking place out over the ocean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you say, just so, because I have trouble with left and right sometimes, a horizontal launch is basically just like a regular airplane an taking apart, off. They're kept just like the, okay. just like regular aircraft, and uh, will climb to a predetermined altitude uh, before lighting the, the rockets. Okay, as opposed to the vertical, which is the blast off that we're familiar That's in correct. Kennedy Space Center. Okay, well, why? a spaceport at Cecil Field. What is it about Cecil Field that w we would even want to pursue a license? Well, that's a very good question, uh, Debbie. Jacksonville Aviation Authority was approached by Space Florida, actually it was the Florida Space Agency in 2004 at the Paris Air Show. Mm -hmm. um, shortly thereafter, uh, the Florida Space Agency disbanded and came back as Space Florida. And they wanted to continue this in endeavor and asked Jacksonville Aviation Authority if they wanted to proceed, which we did, mm -hmm. uh, for several reasons. The Jacksonville Aviation Authority Cecil Field is located very close to the relative population, the highway network, the coast, and all the information we can garner from Kennedy Space Center is very valuable. Not the least of which is the fact, like Bob Simpson was just mentioning, mm -hmm. we have the second lo longest runway in the state of Florida. And so I guess that infrastructure is something that is already in place for a project like this? We have all of the available infrastructure in place and no additional infrastructure will be required to develop the spaceport. And that is that just the runway or does that include other pieces? That's, that is the runway, all the structures, uh, all of the storage facilities are currently existing. So we had things already in place that made it attractive to pursue it. So talk about the licensing process itself. What steps are involved and what kind of timeline are we looking at? Sure, Debbie. The licensing process is an iterative, iterative process uh, that has about four steps. The first of which is the environmental review. Mm -hmm. um, once you finish the environmental protection agency's review, submit all your documentation, uh, they will review everything and came back with comments that will have to be addressed before giving a ruling of finding of no significant impact. Mm -hmm. There's also a safety review which will require the completion of a risk analysis, explosive site plan, and some other safety uh, related issues, documentation. There's also a policy review that has to be completed. The policy review is conducted in order for the Department of Defense, the Department of State to review your documents to make sure that there are no international treaties or Department of Defense mm. issues that are going to be in conflict. So it's, so it's a very involved and complex very process. Involved, very involved process. Work very closely with the FAA mm -hmm. and uh, FAA's uh, Commercial Space Transportation Division. So and where are we in the process right now? Uh, we have completed the environmental mm -hmm. process or the environmental document. It has been reviewed by the FAA and they have sent us some comments. We've addressed those comments. Um, we're also in the middle of, of going through the formal licensing application process, which uh, is the um, formal licensing process. The formal process? licensing process, mm -hmm. which includes the um, explosive site plan oh, okay. and the risk right. analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there any community input? Because I know with the master plan with Cecil Field, the, the development on the other side, there were public meetings to get input. Is that part of this process as well? Yes, Debbie. We've had two public information workshops up to this point. Mm -hmm. One being held uh, approximately a year ago when the process began. The second was held in November. Um, the FAA came in, helped us coordinate the, the, the project. Uh, we gained uh, a lot of comments from the public. There's a lot of public support for the project. Oh, well, that's encouraging. And before we complete the environmental uh, portion of the project, we will conduct a formal public hearing. So what, the environmental part's done, and there are other things going on as well. Any idea when we'll actually receive the license? Our documents will be all submitted in April 
of 2008. Mm -hmm. We look to receive a uh, license by the end of 2008, around December. Wow. And then what? Well, then we can expect <laughs> to have launches. Uh -huh. uh, we're anticipating our first launches to take place toward the latter stages of 2009 into 2010. The maximum number of launches we will, we're currently projecting is a maximum of 12 per year initially. And after about five years, we can expect um, uh, maybe as many as one a week. So there's the potential that we could see some space tourists in the next couple of years? The, initially, the, <laughs> the use of the spaceport will be for tourism and to address <laughs> tourism issues. Uh, as you probably are very aware of Richard Branson and Virgin mm -hmm. Galactic, uh, he currently has a list of about 500 people that have signed up at a cost of about $200,000 a piece to go into space. Right. Uh, beyond that, we're looking at uh, launching orbital payloads from suborbital trajectories, uh, which will be uh, on down the line as we get, as a spaceport uh, system becomes more developed. And then eventually, there'll be a spaceport system, just like there's an airport system today, where people will fly from one spaceport to another. So we're really getting in on the ground floor of this brand new area of aviation slash space we are travel. we are on the cutting edge mm -hmm. of of, sp of space uh, travel, and uh, that is very important as it relates to uh, attracting operators and uh, other tenants to Cecil Field. Now, will we be actually taking care of the aircraft and sending people out in space, or is that done by a third party? That'll be done by an operator or an a operator. third party. Mm -hmm. okay. um, one thing that's, that's important is, is an operator that comes in will have to acquire a license just like, just like the Jacksonville Aviation Authority does for the Cecil Field Spaceport, mm -hmm. and then each launch will have to be licensed. Um, also, as these uh, tenants come in, they will be doing all their own assembly and own launches mm -hmm. from okay. Cecil Field. Well, you've, we've talked a little bit about the different kinds of spacecraft and <laughs> spacecraft, I don't know if that's what they're called, but are there, I think we have pictures of a couple of examples of the concept vehicles. Can you explain what we're looking at here? Yes, th this is the concept Y vehicle. Actually, I'm going to say there's three different concept of vehicles. There's a concept X, Y, and a Z. This is a concept Y vehicle, and the concept Y vehicle will depart just like an aircraft, uh, but it will depart using rocket power from the time it departs till, till it until it returns. Upon its return, as it's returning, after it burns off its rocket propellant, it will come back as a glider. So this one will come back as a glider. It'll take off as a normal airplane, engage its rockets over the ocean, and then glide back? The, con the concept Y vehicle will depart with rocket power. Oh, this one? Oh, OK. It departs with under rocket power. Oh, OK. And uh, climbs uh, into apogee. And then after it burns off its rocket propellant, it will descend. Uh, burning most of its, or uh, getting rid of most of its energy before returning as a glider. Okay, and let's look at the next one. This is the concept X vehicle. This vehicle takes off, departs as an aircraft oh, this is with turbo one. jet power. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it will climb out, go to a predetermined altitude before lying its rocket engine. One thing you cannot see on this picture is, is mounted in the tail cone of this aircraft is the rocket engine. Okay. The engine you see is, is a regular turbojet engine. And they look like regular jets, but... They, they do look like regular aircraft. It's important to note that our license will only include the Concept X and the Concept Z vehicle. And what uh, is the Z vehicle? We don't have a picture of it, but what is the Z vehicle? The Concept Z vehicle is a vehicle that is attached to a, a regular aircraft, similar to you've seen the space shuttle being carried piggyback on another airplane. The Concept Z vehicle will be carried on the back of another aircraft go to a predetermined location out over the ocean before they disengage the aircraft. He will light off his rockets mm -hmm. and climb to a predetermined altitude around 300,000 feet before returning. Okay, so the ones that we're looking to license are the one, the one that takes off as a normal airplane and then engages its rockets or the piggyback one. That's correct. And, <clears throat> and why, do we, why are we not considering the one that blasts off with the rocket engines right away. There's additional information that we want to review before we okay. include that in our licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these operators and all these developers uh, are very new to the industry as well, mm -hmm. and a lot of the information is very proprietary and hard to get a hold of. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we're in the pursuit of 
trying to get some information on the concept Y vehicle so we can include that in our license. Okay, all right. Well, we have one more graphic. We've been talking about how they, their routes and everything. So if we could pull up, so this sort yes. of, the white line, I guess, um, is what we're looking at right now. Can you tell, me, tell us what we're looking yeah, at the, here? The aircraft will depart Cecil Field to the south, uh, climbing out like a, like a regular aircraft uh, before turning to the east and going, in, going out over the ocean. Uh, one thing that, that is not shown here and one thing that you can't see on uh, regular maps is uh, there's a warning area that's established off the coast uh, of Jacksonville. It's, it's been established by the Navy for tactical air training. Um, and these aircraft will fly into the warning area. Once they get into the warning area, then they will ignite their rocket engines and climb into, climb into space. Like I said, about 300,000 feet. The, at the top of the yellow? That's, that's correct. That's 300,000 feet? So that's as high as they go. Any idea how long this little ride lasts? About 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, with about mm -hmm. 15 minutes of that being uh, in weightlessness. 15 minutes? 15 so, minutes. So once we have an operator and it's time to get people to go on these flights, is there a process for, can you just walk up and say, hey, I want to buy a ticket to go suborbital? Well, yeah, passengers will make reservations uh -huh. and they will show up about uh, a week. And there's different programs for different people, but primarily people will show up between a week and two weeks before the departure. And they'll go through a training exercise train will last for anywhere from 10 days to a week uh, where they'll learn about anti-gravity, uh, weightlessness flight, high-speed flight, and uh, then they will go take their trip. So you train for a week or two and then um, you go up for your 15-minute ride? It's like that's, waiting in a long line at Disney <laughs> that's exactly for a 30-minute right. ride. But I'm sure it would be a ride of a lifetime that a lifetime. it would be something well worth going. And I, I imagine, I can only imagine when I think of training, you know, those movies where they're training astronauts where you're blowing into tubes of water and all those other bouncing around in pools and stuff like that. That could be an adventure in and of itself. There will be some physiological training as well as uh -huh. part of this uh, before people take their flights. Okay. Well, if it's going to be within just a couple of years, maybe they need a test dummy or something to go up. I might, I might be willing to try that. But what exciting stuff coming up. And, and it's closer than we think before we start close. going up into space. That's so, correct. Well, Todd, thank you so much for coming and uh, filling us in on this exciting portion of Cecil Field, thank becoming you. a spaceport. I want to thank you again, Todd Lindner, the Administrator of Planning and Development and the Spaceport Program Manager out at Cecil Field. Thank you once again for being here. And thank you for joining us for this edition of the Airport News Show. We'll see you next time. Deflected to the hands of Wilford. It is incomplete. George Reister was the first intended receiver. And Hayden and Sanders around the ball will take Jacksonville off the field. Four drives, nobody put points on the board. Almost a deflection to Wilford. The weekday fix for football fans. You've got to catch that football and take some pressure off your quarterback. NFL analysis from the best in the business. The best receiver in football, period. All season, all year. NFL Live, Mondays at 3.30, Tuesday through Friday at 4 on ESPN. We went around swapping people's vehicles for one week. We didn't tell them we were from Ford. We told them it was market research. I drive a Chevrolet Silverado, and I'm here to swap for a new ride. I like the console, and I like the shifter in it. Okay. It's impressive to have that power in the Ford. As soon as you accelerate, it's pulling. Oh, yeah, I can get used to it real easy. Wish I hadn't bought my Chevrolet.
Now get 0% financing for 60 months plus $1,000 swap bonus cash on a 2007 Ford F-150. Only at your local Southern Ford dealer. When it comes to value, look to the new AT&T. Well, that's true. Those introductory rates from cable can be misleading. Right. Once their short promo rates are over, the real price can be a shock. Get up to $300 cash back when you sign up for all four from AT&T. Comcast can't beat AT&T's lowest bundle price for TV, broadband, and home phone. Guaranteed. From AT&T. Wireless, broadband, home phone, and TV. The new AT&T. Your world delivered. Baselli's back, back with Jacksonville's favorite team. <sighs> Tony, we really appreciate it, but that's not what we mean by roadside assistance. When it comes to the best selection, incredible prices, and award-winning service, nobody beats the Coggin Automotive Group. Stop by today or shop and save online at CogginAuto.com. Coggin. Huge college football game on Thursday.